Hello and welcome everyone to ATC Second Podcast. My name is David Torres and I will oversee the topics and questions for this podcast. This is one of the only tape reading focused podcasts on the internet. Our goal is to deliver the secrets of time and sales that is mastered by very few. We hope that with each and every episode, you gain a better understanding of what we do here at ATC and how we follow smart money. Uh, In terms of feedback that we've been provided by you guys, uh, we do appreciate that and we appreciate how many views that we got within our first episode. So we will be using that feedback into consideration and it will be used this week as well. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Rich Lepis. Rich is the founder and CEO of Ahead of the Charts. Rich uses a live market to teach us, teach his students this methodology of following smart money. And essentially this podcast is just an extension of his teachings. So Rich, how you doing? Hey Dave, how's it going? Not too bad, ready for Thanksgiving, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. So let's just jump into it. Um, we really got a lot of feedback in terms of topics and triggers was one of them. And I believe that'll take up this whole podcast and probably a few other ones. So let's consider this like episode one of triggers. Yeah, it's definitely triggers is one of those things. It's almost as if, you know, I get this question asked to me all the time. It's, you know, how how do you trade? Right. <laughs> it's not just, you know, there's obviously there's so much <clears throat> that really goes into it. But triggers is one of those things. It's essentially how we, you know, go about looking to take our entries, which entry, you know, entry is the, the first stage of actually being able to take a trade. Right. It's our bread and butter. So let's just define what a trigger is in, in ATC for a second. So as a student, my understanding and definition is trigger is defined as price action and volume, but not all price action and volume is a trigger. So it's the release of a position or of a controlling market maker position to build or to make money. Yeah, essentially, that's that's exactly what it is. I mean, there's I know we talked about this early in the, the first episode, but really what a, a trigger is doing is telling us that either they're looking to steal shares from a retail trader or they're looking to allow a retail trader to get in to really help them get the stock to where they want you know, their price target to be. So what a trigger really is, it's the start. It's really them showing us that one of those two phases is is starting to happen. Right. So jumping right into why do students struggle so much with triggers? Like as a student myself, in my opinion, it's arguably the hardest part about trading in general and this methodology. So with the courses that we teach and our one through four setups, uh, it's really easy to to read print personality and then look at the tape and understand what the market maker's intentions are, if they're looking to build or if they're looking to make money on their position. Um, so we can set up a game plan based on the prints. So we can have a price target, we have a stop loss, and we can have uh, we can look for what an entry needs to look like. But that is so simple in in theory. But when it comes to taking a trigger, students have hesitated. They've gone in late on a trigger. They've taken consolidation bars. I mean, the list goes on and on. Why do students struggle so much with triggers from your experience in teaching the past like decade? So I think the the you know I call it the curse of tape reading. So one of the things about being able to tape read is knowing where the stock needs to go overall. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean that it's time to trade. You know, one of the things is that the big part about tape reading is following smart money. And the key word there is following. And we kind of forget that sometimes because when we see a bunch of prints, let's say we you know get beautiful buying and we know a stock needs to eventually go up we almost have that fear of missing out. We want to be in the trade and we want the stock to do exactly that at that moment. So patience is just such a huge variable that, you know, and and a huge thing that needs to be learned in order for a trader to really be able to execute the correct way. You know, not having that patience is just, and again, like I said, the curse of tape reading, knowing where a stock needs to go and wanting to trade it right this second, but we talk about it all the time. A lot of, you know, about 80% of what we do is watching rather than actually trading it. Um, so I know personally in the beginning of my trading career, that was my biggest problem. I mean, it, it's probably one of the biggest problems in my life to this day, but it's having that patience to, to really wait for them to show us it's time to follow. Yeah. And, and there's that quote that I remember you always say that just so stuck in my head is knowing what the stock needs to do is half the battle. Oh, 100, especially as a tape reader, because that's that's, you know, saying a stock is going to go up or a stock is going to go down. That's one thing, but it's the entry and that's where the triggers come in. It's the actual timing 
of when it's time to take that entry and when they're telling you it, you know, and, alleged, and not even telling you, but allowing you to make money with them. Right. And, and I've gone through the phases of, uh, of really what triggers since being a student in the past three years, I've gone from really not knowing what a trigger was at all. And I think most students, when they first become, uh, start in the courses and they learn our four setups, um, it's so easy to look at aspirants at a level and just be like, okay, this is exactly what it needs to do. I'm clicking the button and it's going to do what it, the market maker said it's going to do. But oftentimes you got to let things develop and, and you have to be able to be patient and disciplined and to be able to really define and, and look at the tape and, and, and see when it gives you that trigger. Because oftentimes in the beginning, I, was, I would just see the prints, take the trigger, and then I'd be stuck in a consolidation. I'd be taking a stock that showed great prints but had no volume and I'd be stuck in flow and I or I would see in a stock that was an exception I wasn't following the rules and it just kept going on and on I'd see the ass prints and I'd go okay this needs to pull back and I'd take some slight price action bar that really relative to the rest of the stock was not a trigger um, I wouldn't really look at the substance of the triggers themselves and overall just taking so many and so many sh uh, shakes and being frustrated because the, the trade would play out exactly how I thought it was going to play out because the prints, they, the prints don't lie. It's just the timing aspect, which is so, so difficult. Oh, a hundred percent. And it really, again, I, you know, I, I'm, I want to talk about a few other, you know, variables that are going to come into it, but it really, again, comes down to that patience aspect of it. Cause I, I want you to think about something. How often does a stock go straight up or straight down? I mean, it's not often. The, we, we definitely see the accumulation distribution aspect. And of course, and if for some reason, we all want that to, to happen instantaneously. We want to get into a trade and we want to see it just start to run. That's just not how it works. So if you think about it, a lot of the price action and volume aren't actually going to be triggers unless you have the, the right variables you know, connecting those. So most of the time, price action and volume, you know, let's say we get, you know, a move up with price action and volume, let's make up a number 10 times without a day, there's probably only going to be three of them that actually have the variables that are saying this stock is looking to get as far away as quickly as possible from that actual spot. So again, it's something that we have to know going into it is that every, I've seen, I mean, I can't tell you countless traders over the years that I've taught where they literally will lose seven times in a consolidation and get shaken out seven times when the stock never really showed anything but some movement on the actual chart. And they wonder, well, what's going on? The stock needs to go up. And then just exactly like what you said, all of a sudden the stock you know, skyrockets, but it was the eighth time and they weren't in it at that point because they had already taken it so many times it kind of lost faith in you know, what their expectations were going to be. So it's, there's a few things that we're going to talk and I would like to talk about today that are going to kind of give us a better idea of when it's, you know, when it's time and uh, kind of almost how to use. And, you know, I, I know I said it in the hard traders exchange today, but kind of almost like co-star prints. OK, those prints that that aren't controlling the market, but are giving us indications of exactly what the original market maker is looking to do. And that's such an important aspect of really understanding when to actually take a trade. So. So really just the, the timing print aspect. Yeah. So the timing aspect. So let's for we'll first start off with with one that a lot of people don't take into account at all. So when you sit at your computer and you're looking to trade, what do you want to do? So I'm sitting at my computer. I want to be able to allow my entry to get far away as quickly as possible from. Well, let's bring it down even simpler. Okay. You want to trade. Yeah. I mean, click the Pe button. If, no matter what, when you, if you're looking, if you're sitting at your computer and it doesn't matter what time of day it is, let's say you just, you know, you had something to do in the morning, you just, it's noon and you come into the market and you start looking at things, you see some good prints, you wanna trade, you wanna click the button, you wanna be in it. Who wants to just sit here and watch you know, charts move? I mean, I guess maybe some, but that's, that's not what our yeah. overall goal is going to be. So one of the things about triggers is time of day. And a lot of people mm -hmm. don't ever take this into account. So a trigger between 9.30 and 10 o'clock is very, it, it has a certain percentage to it that it can actually be a trigger. And the percentage is high. 
because we're going to have the best, you know, 9.30 to 10 o'clock, the first 30 minutes, we're going to have the best volume that's being traded throughout the, for, mo for the most part, for the best volume that's going to be traded for the, you know, the entire day. So understanding that certain points in the day, getting a trigger, not all parts of the day are money time. For instance, we talk about between 12 and 1. Well, you know, if you work a 9 to 5, let's say, between 12 and 1, what do you typically do? You, you go to lunch. Yep, you go to lunch. And that's not really that different when you're talking about Wall Street, because after basically about 11 o'clock, you know, lately it's been more about 11 to 11.30 in that area. But basically after that, most of what's going to be happening is on lower volume and it's building time. It's a better time to, to build. And that's why, you know, if you look at most charts, you're going to see after about, you know, 11 o'clock, you see a ton of consolidation. So knowing, a, you know, there's different levels of triggers, you know, depending on the different personality of the stock. But if I'm going to take a trigger that's, you know, after, let's say, 1130 and before 130, it's got to look great. And not only does it have to look great, but it has to have a ton of substance mm -hmm. within it in order to really have any chance of being able to continue. So a lot of people get caught up, you know, I get this all the time and it's, it's like, you know, I have, you know, great weeks and then Friday, you know, Friday I end up giving a lot, a uh, lot back and I take a lot of false triggers and I, you know, take a lot of shakeouts. Well, Friday typically is one of the slowest days that we're going to see during the weeks. So it's not even the time of day, uh, you know, on, on the individual day, but it's the individual days themselves that we see a lot, you know, think about Monday. Anyone that's had, that's ever worked a job in their life, how motivated are you on Monday? Oh no, you're just recovering, really. It pretty much, so we end up seeing a lot of, of false triggers and a lot of stocks. And it really, it, it, it almost cor you know, correlates into volume. So trying to trade and look for a trigger on a stock, you know, at a slower time or on a slower mm -hmm. day, volume and consistency in volume, is so, it's such an important factor. Without that in our trade, we're really kind of setting ourselves up for failure. So before we even look at the trigger, we're looking at the volume and, and time of day. Because, I mean, I've seen some trades that go into noon and one-ish area, but they're trading better volume than they were during the morning, which is a different case. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes the average is that first hour of the morning and then it dies off into noon and then pick up afternoon. So definitely the time frame aspect is something I know I didn't really pay attention to and and something that's kind of interesting, and I you know you've been doing this for a you know a decent amount of time from now, but what price range are the stocks that usually pick up around twelve? It's typically the newer stories, so I would say anything under fifty. I, yeah, I the say. cheaper stocks, right? Yeah, yeah. Our, our cheaper stocks are typically the ones that are kind of they kind of come out of nowhere. So yeah. they got that story in the morning, they had the prints in the morning, then things slow down, and they really just kind of come out of nowhere. Right. It's not the stories that we've been trading all week or all month or been tracking. Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's one thing that we have to look at. It's it's usually a stock that, you know, for the most part, almost, you know, a, let's say, you know, $4 to $15 type stock that had that newer story. It jumped up or jumped down over overnight. And it's just, it's, it's hot. It's on CNBC. It's on, you know, all those financial channels. And then those prints, all of a sudden you just see the volume come out of nowhere, you know, and that one thing that we can't really, you know, hitch our wagon to is the fact that that's kind of an exception. It's an overall, we'll get a couple of those per day, but it's really an exception in how everything else works. So when we come in at noon or 1215 and we see a trigger, we have to understand that's that's mostly going to be by, you know, uh, building time. So it's something we do have to, we have to focus on. And then, you know, again, at the end of the day, if the stock's got enough volume and it's got enough consistent volume, it doesn't matter what time it is. Right. But more often than not, those are the exception types trades that really are coming they're showing themselves for one or two days of trading and they fizzle out mm -hmm. yep. so next thing i want to talk about is did the prints do what they said so mm -hmm. we understand that a lot of buying if market makers don't like to show us exactly what they're going to do what they like to do is they you know for the most part they're taking money because they're building we, we, when we think about their positions we're talking about hundreds of thousands of shares millions of shares it takes a lot of time to acquire these type of shares so if we see huge buying at, at a major level our expectations are they're going to build 
at that point. But what we have to be able to do is we have to base off of what a typical market maker position on the tape is. We have to be able to base on how much it actually, how the monetary amount that would make sense in comparison to what we typically see, the larger percentage of what we see, how far it needs to build before a trigger back towards the prints could even be viable. And that's a big thing that a lot of people get caught up in is because let's say print personality. When I say print personality, what I mean by that is that that's the amount of shares that a typical market maker position gets printed on the bigger side of things. And by bigger side of things, I mean over a thousand shares. So if the print personality is five and we get, let's say 12 prints in a burst, that person's not telling us they're looking to make money right this second. They're telling us they're looking to build. Now, if it's trading in 50 cent increments and increments essentially mean how, what the average position that we see on the tape, how much they need to make. So if it's trading in 50 cent increments and let's say at 650, we see you know uh, uh, prints at print personality, we could expect that they wanna go to seven, they wanna make 50 cents on that actual trade. But if they show us 12 at that 650, what it's telling us is that print personality means it should pull back about 50 cents, the amount that the increments you know, that is trading it. So if we take a trigger at, let's say six, at, even at, let's say 611, it was so far over print personality, it told us it needed to pull back more than six for them to be able to build it. So, so often somebody will see the stock, it comes down just a little bit, or it, it comes down even, you know, in this case, it could come down 50 cents. The prints told us it needed to come down a lot more. And taking a trigger at that point, that is not a high percent trigger because it didn't do what the market makers told us they wanted to do. So taking a, a premature trigger, so that's that's when we get price action and volume that doesn't doesn't fit. So it's price action and volume that technically is a definition of a trigger, but it can't be a trigger if it doesn't go to where they told us in the vicinity of where the, the where they told us it needs to be, which is a huge huge problem for a lot of traders is that they just see that price, you know, the stock pulls down a couple cents, they see that that price action and volume, and they get into it. And then guess what that price action volume was meant to do? It was meant to get them in and then take their money and bring it right back down. And that's a, that's a big reason why every trader out there has always said, it feels like a market maker's behind me watching me. Because I get into the trade and the second I get into the trade, they end up you know, taking my money back. Right. So, so essentially it's not allowing the market makers to fully build on their positions before you look for the actual trade you're just you're jumping the gun on on their building stage that's that's exactly what it is which brings me to my next point one of the the most important parts of figuring out a trigger is understanding did the market maker gain enough interest through retail to be able to pull it back so what i mean by that is that most market makers don't typically fight other market makers because essentially what you know are what we have to understand is that market makers need to make money if they don't make money they get fired so our assumption is that they're always going to be correct but in order so and we talked about exceptions last week and if if a market maker doesn't have enough retail in the trade to pull it back to get enough retail to sell off there's no reason for them to pull it back yet so one of the things that we have to look at is that, oh, is there enough retail? And that's kind of what we use those increments for. And they, they kind of coincide with each other. We use the increments because typically that monetary amount, if, let's say they show us, you know, at 650, they show us 12. I say 650 just because I'm looking at BFRI right now. But if they show us, they show us that they didn't pull it back enough monetarily, typically that means that they didn't get enough retail interest into it yet. Mm -hmm. And the best way to get retail interest is to use a chart. The thing is, is that we're, we talk about tape reading. We're trying to, you know, you know, educate people on how to use supply and demand, which is the way that the market works. But 100% of people have what on their, their platform? The chart, technical yeah. analysis. Exactly. They have a chart and they're looking at te technical analysis. So when a stock comes on one of those financial channels and it's skyrocketing, that's what interests people. So the easiest way for a market maker to get retail traders into a stock is make it run. We've all seen these stocks that have run huge before and every retail trader 
in, you know, out there wants to get in on this because they see it's that fear of missing out. They see the stock continuing up. And then what ends up happening? They get this giant bar that crushes everything because they, in order to build, they have to get interest first, get them into the stock to then bring it back to make them sell. So understanding and really being able to see if, you know, we have 12 prints, Okay, at 650 and print personalities five, that tells us the position they're looking to build needs to be huge. So as they're coming back down and as the stock is pulling back down, if we don't see a ton of retail getting in and we don't see them personally building, so there's a difference. Retails, you're typically going to be under a thousand and our market makers are going to be over a thousand in the way that they go about executing their positions. So if we don't see market makers executing when they're telling us they're looking to build and we don't see them buying as the stock is coming down, that's telling us there's not enough interest for them to do it yet. So the only th option that they have now is to give price action and volume to the upside, then get more interest involved and then bring it back down. Mm. And when we don't see that and we take a trigger, that trigger we're the, and I don't want to say use the word trigger, but that price action and volume is used to take your shares. They know what they're doing. They're not stupid. They've been doing this for a long time. So that price action and volume, and that's where so many people get caught out in the shakeouts is they're not paying attention to the original person they're following. So they're not pick, uh, paying attention to the 12 ask prints at 650 that showed us the market maker was looking to build a lot. Because if a market maker tells us they want to build and they don't build, but then we get price action and volume to the upside, can that possibly be a trigger? No, that, that's, show, that's them showing their cards that they, don't, they didn't have enough under to acquire the position that they wanted to. Exactly. And that's the only way that they can fix that is to give that price action and volume, create what we call a false trigger to get people in and then bring it right back down to then acquire their shares. You know, for every time, you know, it's, someone made a, a funny joke in our traders exchange the other day, and they, they said that there's a market maker that has a trophy case with all my failed accounts. But this is exactly what this is the reason behind it is because that movement to the upside is not meant to go towards a prince. It's not. Remember, we talked about the two points. It's not time for us to help them make money yet. It's time for us to get in so then they can bring it down to take our money. And right. then, as always, oh, as, as everyone's always said, you know, it, I, I got shaken out, and but then it did exactly what I thought it was going to do, and that's how that happens. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel like many students. I know I'm myself personally. It's, it's that's a lot more advanced of a topic because I understand did that market maker have enough to accumulate and acquire the position that they needed to from what they showed us? And if they don't, that price action to the upside is really just used to set up retail. I don't, I don't think that many students have that mindset or understand that concept to really bring it back into their trading. And I feel like if you just understand that concept, it's going to make your perception of the prints uh, and trading that much more advanced in terms of not getting shaked out on those and, and, and ultimately taking that building trade to the higher percentage. There's there's no question behind it. and there's two there's two points that need that really need to be focused on there. Number one is after you get your controlling prints at that level. So in this case, 650, we have to be able to determine the calculation of monetarily how much it needs to pull back. So if we know it's trading in 50 cents and we know it's over double what the print personality is, is we know it's got to be somewhere in about a 75 to a dollar range that it needs to move down first. But that's that's only one part of it, because just pulling back is not enough, because if they tell us they want to build, we have to see them building, because if they don't build, that means the interest isn't there. We're going to see a move back towards the upside, but that's not a real trigger because that's not time to go. That's the time that they need because they weren't able to build and get enough people to sell off or have enough interest there to buy and build underneath that that, you know, in this case, the 650 level. They, there's no way for it to be money time yet. So we have to really listen to what the market maker's telling us by the prints that they show us. Prints are just numbers, but they're not really numbers. It's a story behind them. It's almost like watching the matrix. You know, it's just number, you know, zeros and ones that are running down a screen, but it shows you a picture. So if the psychology tells us that they need to pull back to build, but they pull back to a, a not enough uh, the, to a spot that's not enough. So in this case, let's say they pulled back to 630 
based off that amount of prints, that's not enough. So price action and volume going to the upside, that can't be a high percentage trigger. And then if they pull back enough, where you know, let's say in this case down to, you know, like I said, you know, right around 550, 575, somewhere in that area, but we don't see buying and we don't see the actual building. We also can't really have a high percentage trigger because the whole, the only reason to bring a stock down that you know is going to go up is to acquire more shares. That's the only reason. There's no other logical reason that someone would bring a stock down for the hell of it when they, you know, and not buy anything and or build anything to then just have the stock go back up. So if they're telling us they need to do something and they don't do it, and we take price action and volume just because we have those prints at 650, we're setting ourselves ourselves up for failure. Right. And when the stock does, it doesn't pull back the, the amount it needs to, and then it's a running higher and higher. It's a sure thing that retail is going to be jumping into that because they're just looking at the chart and the price action and they're enticed to that because that's all they see. All they see within their technical analysis says breakout, breakout. But we know what the, the story is behind it. We know what the market maker is telling us is that wasn't enough based upon the amount they showed. So hence, this is a, a setup right here in, in which we want to avoid. It's got to be an exception. Or right. you, and then, you know, there is the other side where you have the personality of a stock that's built for so long where it just starts to run, which is not a very, you know, again, stocks don't typically go straight up. So that that's an exception. That's not something that we can duplicate day in and day out. You know, we're, we, yeah. we're not looking, you, you can't get rich off one trade and not know how to trade because that one trade you got rich off of, you're going to give all the money back. That's just what's going to end up happening. So, you know, you do have a couple other situations, but 90% of the time, this is exactly how we have to see it. And if something does just run as an exception, you know, th again, we can't build a career of consistency off of that. So I'm not that interested in it. Right. And then, you know, you have a, you know, you get to a certain point in your career and you want to shoot from the hip, God bless you. <laughs> you know, you start to have yeah. a little bit more feel coming into it. But, you know, that's, that's one in what, every you know, 150 trades. Yeah, it's not too often we get those. And really, that takes a ton of screen time to really gather. But then again, we're not making the most of our, our income based upon exceptions. It's rather the rules that we're following. Exactly. And that's what creates consistency. Consistency is what creates a, a good trader. Yeah. So kind of leading into the last little question as we're almost running out of time here, how do we distinguish from a bad trigger versus a wrong read? We I think we really might have hit on it a little bit, but I really just want to kind of finish it out with that. So a bad trigger versus a wrong read. So a wrong read happens usually when someone that's looking at time and sales, when you start getting mixed prints at different levels and trying to interpret something that that isn't obvious. Now I tell you know all my students in the, especially you know in our meetings that we do in the morning before we get started in the chat room, I tell you that if it's not something that's blatantly obvious, that's not the first thing that we want to look at because they're as crazy as it sounds. I, there's stocks that I'll look at. I have no idea what they're going to say. So it's really, it's a lot easier to, to get yourself away from having bad reads because most of bad reads come from a stock that's moving. You know, for instance, we could talk about LCID. LCID has been hot over the, you know, the past couple of weeks, every day there's been great trades in it and, you know, but it's been very mixed. It's got a very long story that goes to it. And the bad reads come from, you know, having not really being able to complete, a, you know, an, an over, uh, the overall story of what we're seeing the market makers looking to do because there's just so much that's going into it. So a bad read is going to be mixed prints that could go, you know, essentially almost you could put percentages to uh, a decent percentage to both sides of things. Because at the end of the day, what we're looking for looking for is either a stock to go up or a stock to go down. And when the prints, when it, it's let's say 60, 40, or you know, or you know, uh, 55, 45, or somewhere in that area where it typically it could really go, kind of go one way or could go the other way, and you could justify both of those. That's really what a what, what I, I look at as a bad read. It's just not high enough of a percentage to one side of things. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, I always use the number 70%. If something's not 70%, you should not be looking at it. 
And then having a bad trigger, there, I mean, there's a, a bunch of different ways that, you know, everything that we've spoken about, obviously, but there's a, a bunch of different ways that you could have a bad trigger. Number one is you can get in prematurely and it not hit the volume that it needs to hit. Because remember, the most important part, price action is easy to make. You don't need even need volume for price action. Okay, but volume, to the, you know, so getting in, let's say you need uh, you know, 300,000 shares of volume for it to be a sustainable trigger. And that trigger really show that there's some type of substance behind it. Getting in, let's say at 100, and it's only 150,000 shares. That right there, that's going to be a bad trigger. One of the easiest ways to know you made a bad trigger is trading in a consolidation that doesn't have a large enough range. What I mean by that, if the if a stock is in consolidation and it's moving up 50 cents, down 50 cents, up 50 cents, down 50 cents, that gives you real, doesn't really give you any type of room to be able to trade in it. You know, and, and I say, because a consolidation like RBLX, for instance, there's been times that, you know, we've we traded that, I think it was yesterday, where the, the consolidation was $5. So I have no problem making $2.50 in a $5 consolidation. But when you have too tight of a consolidation and you're trying to trade out of that before the stock actually shows you, it has the ability to break past it. If you see that most of the triggers you're taking are in a consolidation, well, I can guarantee you your percents are low because right. you have no idea, is it that time to break? You might know that the print show it as the ability to break, but until it actually gives you that confirmation, there's nothing stopping it from hitting the top. The sellers come back in and bring it right back. So that's another big part of triggers. You want to give yourself, you know, the ability to, to, to have some type of movement. And when a consolidation is too tight, you don't really give yourself the ability to have room within your trade and have room for it to actually move. You know, I say this all the time. I'm a sucker for a smooth stock because smooth stocks, they, there's not a lot of congestion. So that not having a lot of congestion gives it a lot more, you know, a lot better chance of being able to smoothly move as quickly as uh, quickly and as far away as possible from your actual entry. Right, and that kind of comes down to personality as well as understanding how the bars are are trading and being able to identify if a, a trigger will work out smoothly or not. I, that's, I mean, I could. That's a huge, huge variable. When you talk about personality, there's certain there's some stocks where 90% of price action and volume that comes out of it, the stock ends up coming right back, you know, underneath it. Or if it's to the downside, it comes right back up above it. And if you see a stock with that personality, move on. <laughs> it's just, yeah, that, it's not the one for you. It's surely going to shake you out. So I think we're kind of coming to that half an hour mark, but I think we made some pretty remarkable points that students can take away um, about triggers. I know we kind of just touched the surface of it, but I definitely think this surface is definitely going to open the doorway to more questions for like traders exchanges and classes. Oh, absolutely. And that's the thing, you know, when you talk about, you know, having a topic on triggers, it's essentially how do you trade? How do you get yeah. into a stock and make money off of it? So there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of episodes that are going to continue on this. It's, it's not just, you know, one answer because then <laughs> trading would be easy at that point. So there's a lot of variables and stuff that are going to come into it. But, you know, once you once you really start to to learn trick and don't get me wrong, there's no such thing as 100 percent. There's going to be triggers that you know are 70 percent trades, 80 percent trades that are wrong three, you know, three times or two times out of 10. It's going to happen. It's still the stock market. And then, you know, that brings us to, you know, at one point when we'll talk about cutting losers. But, you know, there's going to be great triggers that don't work out. That's just part of trading. Right. And that's why we have our rules set in stone to cut our loser short. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and it's just but it's it's understanding. Did I take the right trigger and, and understanding what we just went over today is really huge. It's it's the foundation part of, of really grasping that. Phenomenal. All righty, Rich. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I really hope that our students really take value out of this. Absolutely. Now, I hope that you and everyone at ATC and everyone else has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, all. Take care, Rich.